In the previous part of the presentation, I was showing you what happens with sequential testing. Now, what we're going to do is some Monte Carlo simulation of thousands of sequences like the preceding. We're going to stop at P less than 0.05, which means we're going to stop when we reject the null according to that frequentist criterion. Or, we'll stop when the base factor is greater than 3 or less than one third, which means we stop when we reject or accept the null according to this model comparison. Or, we'll stop when this rope excludes or includes the 95% HDI, which means we'll stop when we reject or accept the null according to this other Bayesian criterion. Or, we'll stop when the 95% HDI width is less than 0.8 of the rope width. That is, we'll stop when we achieve a desired precision. Here the desired precision is 80% of the rope width. Let's see what these four stopping rules do when the true theta is 0.5, a fair coin. The top row shows the proportion of sequences that arrive at each decision as a function of n, the number of flips. In the top left, we see what happens when we stop at the critical p-value. As a function of n, you see that more and more sequences have rejected the null. And when we're plotting that against the log n axis, that proportion rises linearly. In fact, if we wait long enough, we will always reject the null, even though it's true. The second panel in the top row shows what happens when we stop at the critical Bayes factor. You can see that early on it does reject some values of the null. These are false alarms, erroneous rejections. But pretty quickly that asymptotes and instead you get these correct decisions to accept the null. So that's one of the nice features of Bayes factors. The amount of false alarm asymptotes here at about 20 percent. The third panel in the top row shows what happens when we stop using the HDI and rope decision rule. It also makes some early false alarms, but then after a while we see it accepts the null, uh, which is the correct decision. So again we have this nice property of a Bayesian approach where the false alarm rate is capped at about 20 percent, even when you have sequential testing with optional stopping. Now on the far right, we have what happens when we stop the critical precision. Now remember, this was not stopping on the basis of reject or accept, but what we can do is once we've stopped on the basis of precision, is consider, oh, now that we've stopped, can we accept or reject the null? And what we find is, once we've stopped, here, we can accept the null about 40% of the time, but we have zero false alarms. We never falsely reject the null. I'll explain the lower panels in subsequent slides. Here's what happens when the true theta is 0.6, that is to say the coin is actually biased to come up heads 60% of the time. On the far left, when we stop at the critical p-value, we see that it always correctly rejects the null. Of course, that's all a p-value can do, but here it just does it more quickly than it did under the null hypothesis. The second panel shows what happens when we stop at the critical Bayes factor. Now, notice here, because of uh, early random events, it will, in fact, accept the null about 60% of the time, even though the null is false. In the third panel at the top, we see what happens when stopping using the HDI and rope decision rule. Here we see that it never falsely accepts the null. It always eventually rejects the null, although it can take a lot of flips to get there. Finally, on the right, we see what happens when we stop at critical precision. So again, we have not stopped according to whether we've rejected or accepted. We've stopped because we've achieved the desired precision, and then we check, 
oh, by the way, does this accept or reject the null? And we see that, in this case, we've rejected the null about 70% of the time, correctly, and we've never falsely accepted the null. The lower panels show the estimated proportion of heads in the sample when we've stopped. What's being plotted in the second and third rows is the sample proportion, z over n, at the point of stopping. So, consider the left column where we've rejected the null. That distribution shows that there tends to be this bias greater than the true value of 0.6. The small black triangle on the abscissa is set at 0.6, which shows the true value. The small white triangle shows the average of the sample proportions at stopping. And you can see that that white triangle is indeed above, more extreme than, the true value. Why does that happen? Well, because when the random flips happen to give you large proportions, then you reject the null and you stop. If you haven't gotten a large proportion, you haven't rejected the null, and you don't stop. Look at the second column. In the second column, we have stopping at the critical Bayes factor. The second row that shows rejecting the null has the distribution of the sample proportions when you've rejected the null, and you can see that the average of those sample proportions falls far above the true value of 0.6. Below it, in the third row, that's the distribution of the sample proportions when the Bayes factor has accepted the null. And you can see that the average of all those is far below the true value. Now, why does that happen? It's the same intuition. The only way you can accept the null is when you happen to have data that are right around uh, the null proportion of 0.5, which is below the true value of theta, in this case. Move to the third column. Here's stopping when the HDI is in or out of the rope. The, pro the sample proportion, on average, again, is above the true value when you've stopped upon rejecting the null. Uh, in this case, the HDI and rope decision never accepts the null, so that graph is empty. On the far right, when we stopped a critical precision, oh, the estimate is pretty much right on target. And why is that? What's the intuition there? Uh, well, we haven't stopped by virtue of there being extreme data. The same pattern of results holds up for other values of true thetas. For example, here the true theta is 0.65, and again, we get the bias in the estimate for any of the stopping criteria based on accept reject, but on the far right column, when the stopping rule is when you've achieved criterial precision, the estimate is right on target. Same thing happens when theta is 0.7, and so on. So, this suggests our goal could be precision in Bayesian parameter estimation. Here, the goal is precision of the estimate. It's not taking sides, or at least we want to achieve precision before taking sides. For example, this is done in political polling or elections all the time. We don't sample people, sample votes, until we can reject uh, one candidate being better than the other. People would get uh, pretty upset about that. Instead, you want to collect as much data as you can to achieve a precise estimate. Precision is requested by journals and regulatory agencies so we might as well make it the goal instead of an afterthought. And this is analogous to Kelly and Maxwell's frequentist accuracy and parameter estimation. K 
Kelly and Maxwell distinguish accuracy from precision, and that should be done in Bayesian estimation too. The idea is that you can have a precise measure that's not um, correct, that is, it's not accurate. For most parameters and most models, uh, precise estimates are accurate. It just turns out that in the case of estimating the bias in the coin, um, there the parameter uh, accuracy and precision are a little bit different, but it's pretty close. And in any case, to do this right in a Bayesian approach, you've really got to consider accuracy uh, as well as precision. But the Bayesian estimation supersedes frequentist confidence intervals because Bayesian estimation gives you what you want. It gives you the actual credible values of the parameters and not a fickle confidence interval which changes when you change your sampling intentions and testing intentions. It's straightforward to compute power and sample size for achieving desired precision. Please see the book Doing Bayesian Data Analysis for How. Now, you might wonder, doesn't this approach put frequentist worries on Bayesian analysis? Well, the frequentist considerations are applied to the planning and collection of possible data. The frequentist notions are used prospectively. In other words, what would happen if I collected data this way? What would happen if I stopped according to these criteria? But Bayesian analysis is used for interpreting actual data. Bayesian inference is used retrospectively, and there are no frequentist concerns such as p-values used to interpret the actual data. Now, are there problems with stopping at precision? Well, there's the file drawer problem. What's that? Well, that's when non-significant results are not published. There's bias in publication which uh, favors publishing significant results. Well, this approach, stopping at precision, says that publication should be promoted for studies that are well motivated and executed and achieve high precision, regardless of the conclusion regarding reject, accept, and null. This is better than publishing everything that reaches a reject, accept conclusion, regardless of the precision, because that rule can produce small n studies with conflicting outcomes. Now, what degree of precision should be sought? Well, enough to distinguish effect-specified theories. And there are uh, guidelines like this in clinical equivalence testing. What's the meaning of precision for obscure parameters like coefficients and logistic regression? Well, that's clarified by previous studies and competing theories. So those parameters actually get meaning with reference to previous studies. What if planned precision can't quite be obtained despite using a sample size from a prospective power analysis? Well, it still yields an unbiased sample, and it's still publishable by that first point above because it informs the field about noise in the measurement procedure and it informs the field about what high precision means in the context of this kind of research. And what if the sample shows a clear accept-reject before reaching the planned precision? And collecting more data is costly or even unethical, like in pharmaceutical studies. Well, that could be a sign that the planned precision was unnecessary or unrealistic. And if collecting data is very costly and if it's unethical, in these cases, well, that implies really you need a full-blown expected utility theory and some optimal design. In conclusion, collecting data until achieving a desired precision has merits worth considering. It's not biased. It's driven by the goal of accuracy, not taking sides. It emphasizes effect size and precision that can be hidden by mere reject-accept decision and the Bayesian approach to this goal supersedes the frequentist approach. Thanks very much.